Why don't you go ahead, grab your Bibles, open up to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. As you're turning there, uh, if you were here last week, we ended uh, with something of a medical analogy, as it were. We're going we're to pick up right where we left off, start in the same place. So I was saying last week, if you go in for a checkup or something like that, and the doctor's poking about, as doctors have a tendency to do, and, and it starts to hurt, you don't get angry with the doctor for making you hurt. You, you get concerned. You go, what's the issue? Right? What's the diagnosis here? Like, Let's start running some tests now. Step two at that point. Suppose you, you, you run those tests and you get the diagnosis. The, the next step is going to be the doctor's going to make some recommendations. There's going to be some uh, simple lifestyle changes that, that need to happen. For example, the doctor's coming to you and going, look, we can deal with this, okay? But it's going to mean a little more exercise. It's going to mean a little less of these foods and a little more of these foods, something like that. And now you have a choice at that point. Now you can respond to the doctor like, well, we gave it our best shot, sorry, you know. Or you can say, all right, I'm willing to make these changes so that my heart gets healthy so that I can continue living the sort of life that I have been living. But you can't expect to get better without those changes. I mean, that's the point. And that's, that's what we're talking about here this morning, because today we are hitting lifestyle, the lifestyle of a steward. We have been building to this for three weeks now. So in, in some ways, I've got apologies for you. If this is your first Sunday out, we're so glad you're here. You're going to be a little bit lost this morning because this is just part four of a really long sermon, okay? I mean, that's, that's kind of how it goes because we don't just start with behavior. Like, that's not how change happens. We don't just all of a sudden try and white-knuckle our sin into submission or something like that. No, uh, our behavior is the fruit of our worship, of our love, what our heart is set on and what it desires most. That's what we talked about two weeks ago. And all of that is, of course, fueled by our attitude, our thinking about those same issues. And that's what we talked about last week. So encouragement to you would be, if this is your first time out and you're hearing this, um, um, it's gonna make sense still, but I would encourage you to go back and pick up at least those last two weeks as well so you kind of get some context for where we are. If your heart is set on Jesus, if he is your treasure, as we sang about this morning, then that fruit of, of a changed life is inevitable. Actually, it was our catechism question. I don't know if you noticed that this morning. That's exactly what it was all about. You're going you're gonna to have the assurance of your fruit, that your heart is actually set on Jesus. And Jesus said as much, you're going to know a person by their fruit. But at the same time, that behavior then also helps the heart. That is, it's this cycle that develops and it, it makes sense in God's economy. And you can see this throughout the New Testament especially. We are either becoming experts in sin or experts in godliness. We are getting better at one or the other because we are constantly exercising those muscles. And so if you begin, if your heart is set on Jesus, you're, you're, you're turning in that direction and you have this desire, therefore, to become more generous, as you practice generosity, you're going to find that your heart falls more deeply in love with Jesus. You're going to go, you know what, these things don't satisfy in the way that my relationship with Jesus does. It's going to make you more generous, which is going to make you fall even more deeply in love with Jesus. So that's what we're looking at this morning. We're going to dig in on the lifestyle of a steward, which we can really sum up in just one word, generosity. Generosity, that's the lifestyle of a, a biblical steward. So Paul is writing to a, a church in Corinth, in modern day Greece, that is trapped by the enticements of the world. You can read his whole correspondence to the Corinthians and you're going to see that they've got some strong attachments to power and status and influence and money. Makes sense that that would be one of those as well. And so he's trying to sort of flip this all on its head for them. Like they're drawn to, to the power and then the status and all of that. And, and, and Paul's saying, let's take a look at Jesus, okay? The way up is down in God's economy. It's about humility. It's about uh, and all these sorts of things. And so he's encouraging their generosity in this passage. He's going to give us an example of generosity, the motivation for generosity, and ultimately some description of the practice 
practice of generosity as well. So with that in mind, let's, uh, let's dig in here. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we'll look at the first part, the example of generosity. Let me read verses 1 to 7 for us. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. So Paul has spent the first part of his letter uh, restoring his relationship with the Corinthians in a lot of ways. He has sent a hard letter previous to this. This is not 1 Corinthians, by the way. This is something in between 1 and 2 Corinthians, a letter that we no longer have. But he sent one to rebuke the Corinthians and especially this group that's a attached to kind of this, this pride. Again, the, the wealth and the status and all that stuff. It's almost, a, if you were here for the Third John series, almost a diatrophies sort of person, somebody who loves to be first. And Paul has rebuked the Corinthians for embracing him. He's rebuked this person specifically, this false apostle. And now that there's been repentance and all that, he's restoring the relationship. And that's what's happened up to this point. And so we get to chapter 8, verse 1, and we get the and now. And Paul's kind of going, okay, now that we've got that settled, right, now that we've dealt with that, let me turn to the matter at hand, the, the, the piece that I wanted to write about in the first place. Because Paul has spent a good chunk of his time in the years A.D. 52 to A.D. 57, so five-year period, gathering a collection for Jerusalem because they are undergoing an immense financial hardship. There's a famine in the land coupled with the fact that they're being persecuted um, in Jerusalem. And so Paul's right into Corinthians saying, I need you guys to contribute. I need you to be a part of this. And his hope is that they'll contribute generously to this endeavor. But in a bit of tact, and Paul is nothing if not tactful in his letters, he, he begins with an example rather than moving straight to the plea. And I find it interesting that Paul speaks of the grace that has been given to the Macedonian churches. It reminds us that giving itself is a gift. Ironic, but very true. That is generosity, a spirit of generosity is itself a gift from God as well as a response to his generosity towards us and loving us and lavishing his grace upon us. And then if you think about it, it's even funnier too because anything that we give generously is all just his anyway. He's given us everything that we have. There's nothing that we have that doesn't belong to him. So all of this experience is the grace of God. Reminds me a little bit of what David says as they're getting ready, ready to build the temple of God uh, way back in those days. And they've taken the offering for this. And, and this is what David prays in First Chronicles 29, verse 14. He says, but who am I and who are my people? that we should be able to give as generously as this. Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. And that's what we talk about when we say that giving is, is grace itself, his grace lavished on us. You're gonna see the word grace a lot. I mean, just in those seven verses that I just read, grace shows up a bunch of times. Paul won't let us forget this central theme, that it's all of grace. So then we come to verse two, and it's this shocking verse. Their extreme poverty is welling up into rich generosity. Now, that doesn't make any sense to us. The only possible explanation for that is if they had this exuberance of joy in Christ that Paul mentions. It's the only way that you would give not just as much as you were able, but even more than you were able, like Paul says in verse three. 
What does that mean? To give even more than you're able. Uh, We talked about this last week, that there's a difference between our wants and our needs. So giving more than you're able is when it starts to affect your needs as well. Reminds me of Jesus when he's looking at the uh, offering at the temple and he sees a bunch of rich people come by and they put in the amount that they're supposed to put in and Jesus goes, meh, it's a lot of money but it's nothing for them. This is easy for them. And then a widow comes by and she puts in just a tiny little bit but it's all she has. She's going hungry that night. You see, that's giving beyond what you are able. This is not just she didn't get to buy something nice that she wanted for herself. She doesn't get food that night. That's what Paul's talking about here. You're gonna feel the pinch of their gift. And so you can see why then in verse four, Paul says they're actually pleading with Paul in order to give. Like he's trying to talk them out of giving. I don't want you guys to go hungry, okay? It's fine, we'll get it somewhere else. You know, in Corinth, they got lots of money. Let me talk to them. And they're like, no, 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 we're not, we're not missing this opportunity. We are gonna be a part of this. So we talked about when they're building the temple and the offering they took then. When they first set out after the Exodus, they're getting the tabernacle ready, like the phase one of the temple, and the exact same thing happened. So this is Moses, uh, recorded in Exodus 36, verses six and seven. Then Moses gave an order, and they sent this word throughout the camp. No man or woman is to make anything else as an offering for the sanctuary. And so the people were restrained from bringing more because what they already had was more than enough to do all the work. Right, wow, that's the right response. Thank you for whoever said that. Wow, I mean, can you imagine? Like you're in a church, you're doing a building campaign, you're taking an offering for the missionaries, you got some compassion initiative that you're working on, and the pastor's gotta get up and be like, whoa, whoa, stop. All right, ushers, come on back. Like that's plenty, okay? You guys are done. That's enough, that's too much money. We're not giving any more today, okay? When has that ever happened? That never happens. In fact, here's the way one commentator put it. He says, normally we think of the fundraiser as begging the would-be donors. That's right, that's how it works. Here it is the donors who could least afford it who entreated Paul for the favor of having part in this enterprise. I mean, that example just puts us to shame. Just puts us to shame. No other way around, we can just embrace that shame right now and go, that's not how we give. The reason why, Paul says, is because they gave themselves to God first and foremost. This is not just an issue of money. This is a wholehearted gift. This is my whole being as a living sacrifice on the altar of God. When you do that, everything else just starts to spill over. And so this zeal for God becomes a zeal for his mission, which means they're going to give themselves into service to Paul as well. And that's what's happened here. And so they, (laughs) Paul says, they exceeded my expectations. Understatement, right? I mean, yes, they exceeded our expectations, absolutely. But then note verse seven, because here Paul pivots from Macedonia to Corinth, and he says, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. They exceeded my expectations. That's your target too. See that you also excel. Reminds us too that giving is a skill. It's a skill, which means like any other skill, it takes practice. You're not gonna be good at it at first. You gotta, you gotta work on this for a bit. One of the reasons why setting goals in giving can be so helpful. Like setting goals just help us generally. So you got a goal, you wanna run a five minute mile or something like that, or an eight minute mile, a 12 minute mile, whatever your goal would be, okay? That's not the important part here. But you got a goal. You, you don't just get up on Saturday and go, I'm going for a run. Okay, I didn't get real close. I'll try again next Saturday. No, like if you got a goal, it means you're gonna set up a training regimen. You're gonna be working on speed and endurance and all of these things. And that's what Paul is saying here. What do you need to do in order to excel in the grace of giving? Randy Alcorn in his book, The Treasure Principle, uh, shares a story of a, of a businessman named Scott Lewis who attended a conference with Bill Bright, who's the leader of Campus Crusade for many years, tremendous man of God. And Bill Bright was challenging these guys to give a million dollars to this particular initiative. And this, Scott Lewis just laughed. He's like, I'm in the wrong room, okay? I started a business last year. We brought in $50,000 in income. So I don't know where you're getting this million from. Like, that's not coming. And he went up to Bill afterwards and was like, I'm, I'm in the wrong room, I'm sorry. Like, I'm gonna go find the other donor room down the hall or something like that. And so Bill says, how much did, how much did you give last year? You made $50,000, how much did you give last year? And the guy said $17,000, which is a chunk. And that's 35% of the income. $50,000 is not exorbitant wealth or anything like that. So this is a guy who 
to our minds, is excelling at the grace of giving. And Bill looks at him and says, okay, so this year, set a target that you're gonna give $50,000. And the guy's like, I think you misheard me. <laughs> That's 100% of my income then. Like again, we did food and clothes. We'll be content with that, but I'm gonna need to buy that at least. But he agreed. He agreed to it. He said, okay, we'll set that as a target. Not signing my life where I am. I will set that as a target at least. And uh, especially because of uh, almost miraculous provision that came in December of that year, able to give $50,000. I mean, just incredible to see. This is somebody who excelled in the grace of giving. Near the end of the sermon today, I'm gonna suggest doing something similar. I'm gonna suggest picking a number. And this is why. If we want to excel in the grace of giving, we need to, we need to set a target so that we can start to work at this skill. Now, one last point, too. Remember that Paul is saying all these things about the Macedonian church to the church in Corinth. And he even says in verse eight, which we haven't read yet, but he says, I'm gonna test you by comparing the sincerity of your love with the earnestness of others. So Paul's actually directly comparing people's giving. It reminds us of something that I don't think we believe, which is that it's good for us to talk about our giving habits with others. I know some of you immediately are like, no, 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 Matthew 6, Matthew 6. It's in the Bible. Jesus says, don't talk about your giving. That's not quite what Matthew says, what Matthew records Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying there is he's saying, you don't want to make a show of it. You don't want to go into the marketplace and trumpet your gifts. You don't want to give in order to be seen. Plus, there we're talking about above and beyond gifts. This is a, a different sort of gift than, than what we're looking at here. But there's a... The, the temptations with finances are too strong for us to keep it completely hidden. Like there is a place for us to get into a community of believers who know us well, who can challenge us, who can exhort us, who can admonish and even rebuke us on this point when it's necessary. And especially because giving is so often infectious. And so it's this encouragement to others when we are open in appropriate biblical ways about the way we give. When you hear stories of sacrificial giving, it is a tremendous, tremendous encouragement and that's what we have here. That's exactly what Paul is doing. Or I read this just a couple weeks ago in Christianity Today, an article that came out. This was over a century ago in northern India. Uh, the Christians there, who were some of the poorest in the country, um, started this practice. And they were inspired by their king who gave his life that they might have life in him. So they're inspired by the example of Jesus. And so they started this practice where um, every day when they would cook rice for themselves, the staple of their diet, they would take a handful of uncooked rice and throw it into a special container. And then they would gather, you know, these special containers from all over the community. They would sell that rice and the profit would go to uh, help missionaries support one another. The first year they raised $1.50. That's not that much. But they were faithful in it. At this point, again, we're talking a century later, but the practice has, has continued. They raise around $3 million dollars. Again, these are the poorest Christians in a country that is not particularly wealthy. And yet, across a century, these Christians have supported thousands upon thousands of missionaries and been able to show compassion to those who are in need as well. That example, especially because that's an example of extreme poverty welling up into rich generosity again, that example encourages me. And that's what I mean with this. We can encourage one another with our giving. That takes us, though, to this next section, then the motivation for generosity in verses 8 and 9. These Indian Christians were inspired by the example of Christ, and that's what Paul says here. Let me read verses 8 and 9. He says, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. This is the shortest section that we're going to read, shortest section I'm going to comment on, but it is the most important section because it deals with the heart. I mean, this is the section that will reorder our loves, that will get our hearts set on what it should be set on. The Christians in India looked to the example of Jesus. That was the motivation for what they did. 
And now we can compare ourselves to them. Why? Well, Paul tells us to test the sincerity of our love. And that's what we've got to look at here. We have to test the sincerity of our love. Our love for what? Our love for Christ. Our zeal for his glory and therefore our zeal for the mission that he has given us. The fruit shows what kind of tree it is. So we're testing the sincerity. You'll never walk by a tree and go, boy, that's weird, that apple tree is producing oranges. I've never seen anything like that. You think to yourself, it's an orange tree. I mean, that's how trees work. Stingy, selfish fruit does not grow on a Jesus-loving tree. So you got stingy, selfish fruit in your life. It's the wrong kind of tree. That's the issue. Right? We've got to look at the heart. We've got to look all the way down at the roots there. How could stingy, selfish fruit grow on a Jesus-loving tree? I mean, how could that possibly happen when we know his grace? and his great love for us, that even though he was rich in his heavenly glory, yet for uh, for this reason he became poor in the incarnation, in his uh, humbly coming to live among, now why? Why would he do that? Why would Jesus give up the riches of glory to be born as a small, helpless child in a barn, you know, laid in a trough, in a it's a tiny little town in a backwater province. Why would Jesus do that? Paul tells us, for your sake. For your sake. That's why. So that you might become rich with true wealth as a consequence. If Christ doesn't embrace the poverty of the incarnation coming to live among us as a human, well, that means he, he doesn't get to live the life that we should have lived. He doesn't die the death that we deserve to die, which means we are still then trapped in our sins. There's no sacrificial substitution on our behalf. But no, Jesus did not regard the riches of glory as something to be used for his sake, but he spent it for our sake. And in doing that, he models generosity for us. But it's more than just a model. It is the motivation for our sacrificial generosity as well. And we are given infinite, infinite riches in Christ. We talk about the cups overflowing, and you can dump it out, and it's still full at the end of it. So if that's the sort of infinite riches that we have, why wouldn't we keep dumping it out for the sake of others? If he's going to keep filling us back up anyway, why keep it? Why not spend it on behalf of others? It reminds us, too, that we're not giving, and this is so important, we're not giving to earn God's favor, which we cannot do. We are giving because he gave himself for us before we deserved it, right? He's given us undeserved favor. That's grace. We don't have anything left to earn. This is just a response to it. It's why if you looked at the next chapter, chapter 9 verse 7, Paul writes this, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's the type of giving that is motivated by Christ's sacrifice. It's not under compulsion. It's not this sense of, I need to do this in order to look good in God's eyes. It's cheerful, joyful, worshipful giving in response to all the gifts that God has lavished on us, especially his son. It's the giving that Isaac Watts describes so well in his hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Were the whole realm of nature mine, that were an offering far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all, everything, surely includes our wealth. And so let's start to look at that now in the practice of generosity in this last section, verses 10 to 15. Let me read it for us. And here's my judgment about what is best for you in this matter. Last year you were the first not only to give, but also to have the desire to do so. Now, finish the work, so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. For if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. 
At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality, as it is written. The one who gathered much did not have too much and the one who gathered little did not have too little. So here we get to the nitty gritty. Again, kind of where the series has been going this whole time. The practical advice from the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians. An advice that will guide us today as well. I love, by the way, in verse 11, when Paul says, finish the work. Finish the work. I think that's an important reminder for us. Because there's a good chance that if you've been with us through this whole series, at a few different points, you've felt a little stirring in your heart. Like the Spirit of God is at work, and there's this sense of, okay, I should be doing something here. And Paul's saying, what's going to come of it? What's going to come of that stirring? Is it going to pass and you're going to forget what the sermon was about because that's just kind of what we do? Or is this something we're going to put into practice? Finish the work, Paul says. But then he says, now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it according to your means. And that is a key phrase in the New Testament for the approach to giving that the apostles uh, commend. It moves us away from the idea of a fixed percentage, 10%, right? That famous tithe moves us away from a fixed percentage in our giving. So let's talk about this for a moment. Let's talk about the tithe for a moment. The idea that 10% is what we give to the church, or something like that. The tithe, that 10% idea, is an Old Testament concept. You can find it throughout the Old Testament. It is a concept that is expanded in the New Testament, which is what we would expect because most of the letters of the law are expanded to include the spirit of the law in the New Testament. So Jesus validates the concept of a tithe in the Gospels when he's speaking to the Pharisees at a few points, but he goes beyond it. We never see Jesus lowering the moral bar in the Gospels. So it's just not what he does, nor does he ever set it aside. He's always raising it. So he says, look, you heard it said don't commit adultery, and yeah, that's right. That's a good aim, okay? But let me tell you this. You shouldn't even be lusting after someone else. And you see that's a raising of the bar. Or he says, you know, you guys are worried about whether you should be swearing uh, by heaven or by earth. Here's an idea. Just tell the truth all the time so you don't have to worry about taking oaths. That's what we have here as well. He seems to go, uh, Paul seems to go beyond the letter of the law. Again, go back to Jesus as he's there at the temple watching people bring their temple offerings. And he watches the rich people bring in their 10% and he goes, I'm not impressed by that because you're giving out of your surplus. You're not even going to feel that. That's not going to change your lifestyle in the slightest. Then he looks over at the widow who gives more than 10%, given 100% of what she has right then. He says, there you go. That's it. That's what it looks like. So I think what that means is we can look at the 10% as sort of a mandatory minimum, but that Jesus expects much more of us. And that's a challenge, okay? This whole idea of whether or not we should be giving 10%, let me put it this way. I don't think it's a question we should be asking. It's because of where we live. And we live in the richest society in the history of the world. And we live in a rich part of that society, by the way. So if we can read according to your means and come out under 10%, when you're looking at people like Mary and Joseph, we know lived in poverty and they're given that much at least, like I think we're asking the wrong question. I think our hearts are in the wrong place. Now just about every study ever done confirms the fact that in the United States, Christians give between 2 and 3% of their income. That is not according to our means, not by any stretch of the imagination. And it's actually interesting because we lie probably to ourselves about this. You interview Christians, one-third of them will say they tithe, that they give 10%. And if you look at their finances, the number is actually closer to one-eighth. Like not only are we not giving, we're lying about the fact that we're not giving. So uh, you can see why this, is, this ought to sting a bit for us. And we're thinking, no, I can't possibly get up to 10%, you know, because I gotta double my internet speed because when we're streaming on all five devices simultaneously, it takes a little while for the video to buffer. I mean, you can laugh and that's fine. It was funny, it was meant to be funny, but there's an indictment in there of how we live our lives and the judgment that we'll be called to account when we stand before Jesus with that sort of lifestyle. This is kind of a serious consideration then. 
It's a serious moment. If the tithe is the bare minimum requirement, if that's the part that God says, this belongs to me, this is the first fruits, this is the reminder to you that all that you have comes from me, what if we're not doing that? Which most of us are not, based on simple statistics. What if we're not there at that 10% number? God actually talks about this through his prophet Malachi. So what God says, will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. You see what God's saying? He's saying you are robbing because you refuse to bring the whole tithe in, that mandatory minimum. Just let that sink in, especially as we're moving ahead in terms of starting to set targets for yourself and whatnot. Like if, if you came to me and you're like, hey, pastor, we need a little counsel. Okay, so last year I robbed 10 convenience stores. And this year, because you know, I'm feeling convicted about this, good sermon series, thanks pastor, by the way, uh, I only wanna rob five convenience stores. My advice is to me, like, maybe, maybe think about knocking off zero convenience stores this year. Like, maybe that's a better choice. Maybe that'll get us closer to where we ought to be, something like that. That's what God's saying here. You're stealing. Stop stealing. That's a good place to start. Now, I understand. Like, I gotta, I say this because I love you. I'm for you. I'm not against you, okay? I understand that some of you have dug holes for yourselves, and it would be very difficult to just 10% like that. I, I get that. You bought a car that you should not have bought, and the monthly payment is hard, and you will, you know, bad things are going to happen kind of thing. Fine. Set a time frame at least. And it should be a tight time frame, not like, well, as soon as the house is paid off. So in 29 years, I should be able to get to 10%. No, like one year, three years max. Get yourself moving in that direction. Stop stealing from God. Now, the aim of the giving described in the Bible is twofold. There is kingdom work. That's giving to things like the church. That's what Malachi is describing, bringing the tithes into the, into the temple area. Then there's also charitable giving to relieve the poverty of others, and that's what Paul is describing here in 2 Corinthians 8. So let's dig in on charity a little bit. You can see in verse 13 that Paul says that there is a relative equality on view. All right, our, our desire is that there might be equality. Got to say this, this has nothing to do with political or economic theories. Paul is really unconcerned with the government at this point. Talks about it occasionally, Jesus did too. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Great, so other people can worry about that. We're talking about you and your charitable giving. We're talking about Christians as Christians. Our goal is to see relative equality in the world, especially among Christians, so that it looks like the way manna worked when they were wandering about in the wilderness. That's verse 15. The one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Notice, by the way, it is a relative equality. Some have more than others still, but the point is you may have much, you don't have too much. You may have little, you don't have too little. So that's relative equality is what we're after. Not plunging ourselves into poverty so that others can get luxury cars, Paul says, but the idea is that every Christian has what they need. And that's our goal. Every Christian on the planet right now, and I think we could extend that, there are other pastors we could look at, every person on the planet right now should have what they need. That's why we've been given money to make sure that that comes to pass. Needs, not wants. We talked about it last week. We have food and clothing and we added shelter to that list. Maybe education would be something we'd want to add to that list. Fine. Needs. Every Christian, every person on the planet has what they need. Now, if the goal is equality, and that's not a guess, by the way, that's verse 14. The goal is equality. If the goal is equality, then that means that God has given us money more than we need. God has given us money for a purpose, to serve others, to raise them from too little to little, but enough, what they need. That's not surprising, by the way. I'm sure some of you are there thinking, if the goal is equality and God's sovereign, as he certainly is, why not just make sure everybody gets the exact same amount? It's a good question. 
it's a good question, but that, that's not how God works because this is part of how he builds character, gives us a gospel understanding and we can demonstrate gospel love. We're most likely at some point in our lives gonna be on both sides of this equation. There's gonna be moments, you know, usually when you're first married, something like that, like you're struggling to pay bills and somebody's gonna help you out and then later on, you're gonna be able to help others out and on both sides of that equation, you get to experience something of gospel love and it trigger something in your mind. You grow up, right? There's a maturity in Christ that comes of it. Of course, God invites us to participate in his redemptive purposes on earth. It's the same reason he doesn't save people by zapping them with lightning or something, but he says, no, no, you go and talk to your friends, okay? I want you to be a part of this process. That's what he does with giving as well. But so if we've been given money, in essence, to deliver it to others, to raise them out of their poverty, what does that mean? Well, so Let's say you put together a little care package for your sister who lives across the country or something like that. You give it to the FedEx guy and you watch him take the package into his truck, pull out his box cutter, just crack it open, just see what's in there, you know, and pull out some of the stuff that he thought might be kind of nice for himself. Like you'd have issues with that. You'd be going, I gave this to you not for your sake, but so that you could get it to someone else. That's kind of what God's doing with us. It's not that simple, I grant. Because, of course, there are things in the package that we are supposed to take out. So, like, it's a little more complicated. Some of the package is for me. How do I figure it out? How do I figure out how much of this package I'm supposed to keep? It's more like uh, you know, kids going off to summer camp or something like that, and, and mom gives the oldest one 100 bucks and says, this is for you to pay for the activities and the food and stuff. It's for you and your siblings. And the oldest kid is like, what, $33 each? I'm older, I eat a little more, I get 50 and then 30 and then 20. Like, help me out here, okay? That's much closer to what we have in this moment, and it's hard. All I can say is that, look, we know it when we see it. We know when we've gone too far, even if it's hard to draw a firm line. Now, I'm in a blessed position in that I am supported by the church. So your tithes and offerings, they pay my salary. So I'm very keenly aware of the fact that I live on God's dime. And when I I take business trips, for example, which I'll do, you know, we'll attend a conference or um, visit missionaries, uh, ministry initiatives, something like that. I mean, I I turn in my expenses to the church. And so that, that messes with your thinking a little bit in a really, really good way. So like Daniel Tiger here, let's play make believe for a moment. All right, so Kyle and I are going on a a business trip to Atlanta. We got a conference down there, something like that. And we fly first class because, hey, we work hard, okay? (laughs) It's the least we could do. Fly first class. We get there, we're looking for a hotel, and there are some nice options in town, but we find the nicest option in town, the five-star one, like the really pampered one, because again, we work hard, bad back, want to make sure we get a good night's sleep, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we don't share a room, you know, none of this two queen bed stuff, that's just weird. So we each get our own room, <laughs> and actually we're getting suites because it's just nice to have the sitting room. I mean, that just <laughs> feels necessary. And we gotta eat when we're down in Atlanta. And we drive by in our rental car, which is Mercedes, because you just want to know that you've got the safety and security that the Mercedes offers. <laughs> we drive by Chili's, and Applebee's and Chipotle, and we pull into Capitol Grill or some other Zagat-rated restaurant or something like that. And we're there, you know, gotta make sure, gotta eat so we're there in the conference, we're sharp, we're paying attention to all that, and so we get some appetizers, dozen and a half oysters, which would be for me, I don't think Kyle eats those, but I would be happy to have them. Uh, Surf and turf, because it's excellent at the place, it's what the guy recommended to us. A bottle of wine and like a decent one, you know, $100, $120 bottle of wine. I know some of you were like, you shouldn't be drinking wine anyway. Let's focus on the analogy, okay? I'm trying to run up the bill. (laughs) Just trying to run up the bill and wine is a good way to do it. Okay, so in the course of a two-day conference, you know, we spent like five, six, seven, eight thousand dollars. How do you think the elder's gonna feel about that? Treasurer, when they look over the expense request. You guys, the auditors, all that kind of stuff. Like, actually, even the IRS would frown on this. They would say, these are not legitimate business expenses. You can't get reimbursed for this. Right, so you understand, there was a line somewhere that we went past in this illustration. Now, we might disagree about some of those lines. You might say, you shouldn't be fine first class, but if you go economy plus, and some would go, no, no, you guys aren't that tall. You don't need the leg room, okay? You're fine for economy. And some might go, no, that's fine. Economy plus makes sense. 
You get the hotel, you go, maybe Red Roof Inn, but maybe some of you are going, that's a little divey. Why don't we try more and like it? Wouldn't get a Marriott or something. That's fine, okay? That's a good, some of you would say, you should hit Aldi on the way. Pick up some stuff and you can have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches in your hotel room. <laughs> that's fine, right? Like that's a, some of you would go, no, 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 Applebee's, Chili's, that's fine. And even there though, you might have people thinking, look, there you got to pay a tip. Everything's a little bit more expensive because of the service. Why not just do a Panera or a Chipotle or something like that? So we could fight about some of those things. We might land in different places, even though we know that there is a line somewhere over here and you get on one side of that line and it is an unreasonable expense. It's exactly how we have to view our lives. I mean, this is how Randy Alcorn says it, how all this relates to stewardship, the fact that everything we have belongs to God. He is the owner. He says this, suppose the owner sees us living luxuriously in a mansion, driving only the best cars and flying first class, or buying only expensive clothes and electronic gadgets and eating at the best restaurants, isn't there a point when, as his stewards, we can cross the line of reasonable expenses? Won't the owner call us to account for squandering money that's not ours? That's the question we have to ask. So with that in mind, what do we do now? And how do we move towards excelling in giving? I'm gonna be brief, but let me give you some practical steps here. First of all, set a target. Set a target. I'm encouraging you to do that right now. Like get a pen, you got the bulletin in front of you. Set a target. It's okay if this is not the one you land on, but for now, just write down that visceral response. Where is the spirit guiding you? Pick a number. Either a dollar amount that you want to give or a dollar amount that you want to increase or a percentage, same thing, that you want to give or that you want to increase. Write it down. I know this is not necessarily entirely up to you. This includes everyone, by the way. You're like a high school student, you make $20 a week. Great, write a number down. Okay, write a number down. You're married, this is something you should talk about with your spouse. I've been praying all week long that you guys are going to come to the same number. I'm hoping that there are some uh, miracle moments here where you guys are jotting down numbers and you look at it later and you go, Okay, that's crazy. Like, how do we come up with the same number? So I'm pretty, it's fine if that's not you, by the way. Don't be like, I guess the Spirit of God's not working in my life. No, that's fine. Talk it out. That's how the Spirit of God works as well. Pick a number. And then two, you set a target, share that target. Share that target with your community. In community group, you're gonna be talking about it the next time you guys meet. It does not have to be that specific. I understand that that can cause division, right? You can say, we want to double our giving this year. They don't need to know necessarily that that means going from 20,000 to 40,000 or 3,000 to 6,000, right? Like the double is enough for them to encourage you to ask you questions that they need to ask, but give them enough that they can encourage you. And for some of you, I understand this. There's no shame in this. It's fine to come to them and say, we're not at that 10% level and we are gonna spend the next year getting to 10%. We'd love for you to ask us how that's going. Set a target, share that target. And then third, and this one's, really important, figure out how to reach the target. What lifestyle changes do you need to make in order to be healthy? Are there unreasonable expenses in your budget? Cut them out. Do you need to right size your life in any way? You got too much car, you got too much home, you're taking too many vacations and the places you're going are too nice. You got too many hobbies and every six months when you start a new hobby, you buy the very best stuff for that hobby. Do you need to do something to right size your life? And third, can you, can you fast from something to free up funds? This is how a lot of us would work. We go, you know, we eat out twice a week. We're gonna, we're gonna set a goal now. We're only gonna eat out once a week and that extra money, that's all going into our compassion giving. A quick note, by the way, this is how the church functions too. I believe churches should be tithing. We do at this church. In fact, we give a little bit more than 20% away to missions and to compassion initiatives. Um, There's only so much money we need to run the church. Like if our attendance doubled, we would need to hire some more staff. There'd be some more expenses and whatnot. But if attendance stays the same, the giving goes up, that just means more money leaves. Okay, this is how that works. So if you're confused about who to give this to, you're like, I don't know. I mean, do we just keep giving to the church? Fine, we'll get it to the right missionaries. We will get it to the right people so that these sorts of things uh, happen. Let me close, and I realize I've gone about an hour, but that's okay. That's just sometimes we've got to go long. That's what the word of God has for us. Like, calling to mind one of the most iconic scenes in recent cin- cinema uh, from Schindler's List, the end of the movie, when the 1,100 Jews that Schindler has saved from the Nazi death camps are gathered around him after they've been liberated, and they uh, yanked a filling out of one guy's mouth, and so they make him this little gold ring as just a token of their appreciation. Uh, My favorite scene in the movie, by far, is when he first gets the ring, he actually drops it. 
It's like it's so precious, he's holding it so delicately that he drops it and he's scrambling about trying to find it. You can tell that this ring has instantly become his most prized possession, even though he is a wealthy man with a lot of things. That ring, to my mind, symbolizes the well-done, good and faithful servant that we will hear in glory if we have been faithful of what we're called to do. But so he's given this ring and he's looking around at all these people that he's saved and he says this. He says, I could have done more. And he starts laughing and his laughter quickly turns to tears. I threw away so much money. You have no idea. And he starts walking around. He looks at his car there. He's going, this car, why don't I keep the car? That's 10 people. 10 more people I could have saved. It's pin, it's gold. Could have saved two. They would have given me two. At least one, he says. And he just goes through his stuff. At the end of your life, when you are standing before your maker, receiving your reward from the owner, you, you may have the same regrets that Schindler had. But I can promise you this. You will never regret what you have given away. Like Schindler actually falls to his knees weeping because he knows he could have done more. I think we will experience that same bitter sweetness. I don't think we think that way about glory. I don't think we imagine that when we see Jesus face to face that there will be any bitterness in it. There will be at first because we will instantly see what fools we have been, not just with finances, but in every area. We just think, why, why did I do this? But with finances too, this car, why did I drive this car? This house, why did I buy so much house? This phone, why do I keep upgrading this stupid phone? This trip, why did we go there? Why did we spend that money? The question I have for us, because I think we're all gonna feel that bittersweetness regardless. Will we feel it like Schindler, thinking that after we have done so much? Ben Kingsley, who's kind of the lead Jew in the movie, he, he, he says to Schindler, he says, look around, there will be generations because of you. And you get to see them at the end of the movie. It's a true story. Will there be generations because of you and your generosity? Let's take an eternal perspective, eyes fixed on Christ, who for our sakes, though rich, became poor. Let's pray. Lord, as we consider all that you've done for us, all that you gave up on our behalf that we might be raised to spiritual wealth out of spiritual poverty and death, Lord, may it bring us to a place of willing, joyful, worshipful sacrifice and generosity for the glory of your name. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen.